Hi there, welcome back. Hollow Kingdom chapter 16. Um, we just finished a chapter that was a beautiful oratory from Will and translated by a J. Um, but now we're back to ST, who's at the, at the zoo. So let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 16, ST, Woodland Park Zoo, Seattle, Washington, USA. We were losing light and I didn't like it. I instructed Dennis to wait by the turnstile gate. It was safer for me to be airborne, and my heebie-jeebies were telling me to do recon of the zoo solo. Besides, Big Jim never brought Dennis to the zoo, even though he snuck me in once. My suspicion is that Big Jim had been shielding him from an alpaca exhibit. Inexplicably, Dennis is deathly afraid of alpacas, but leaving him on the ground at the mouth of the Woodland Park Zoo, vulnerable, a survival greenhorn, felt nothing like I'd ever experienced. Caches, especially ones I'd stuff with special sought-after treasures like golf balls, antique mofo collectibles, Rolls-Royce hood ornaments, or tender Tiffany's diaphragm, were always very hard to leave. After the electric thrill of meticulously concealing my treasure, I'd always embark on the Oscar-worthy theatrical production of nonchalance, pretending the new cache didn't exist, and that I wasn't thinking about it 24-7. This was so much worse. Leaving Dennis was to feel a chronic hollow ache, untreatable until I saw the, his ridiculously saggy skin again. I fluffed myself up and fluttered over the gate, finding stacks of rock formations. In full investigation mode, I lowered to perch atop one of the large beige rocks. Speckling of the very worst kind of white shit told me what I needed to know. This is where the penguins live. I gagged, barely holding an partially digested garbanzo flour chocolate chip cookie. The thought of those bollock Jedis living here shitting their lives away on mofo property was difficult. And now where were they? The glass that looked to have held a large pool of water for the wang bags to swim in was now in shining shards. A world where penguins roamed free. God help us all. I thought about how Big Jim hated penguins and how we had laughed at them the time he took me to the zoo. They were weird, fake-ass birds that couldn't fly, strange and useless. What in the hell is the point of a bird that can't fly, he had said in between bites of a chili dog. He said they were a waste of space, much like people who believe in ludicrous things like environmental protection and tofu. A comet shot across the sky. Then I saw something else. Streak, jet black, careen above the tree line. Two crows were performing aerial gymnastics, soaring high above only to descend into a pirouette of corkscrew dives. They were fucking playing. My blood boiled. I snorted my contempt and got back to attending urgent matters and exhibiting productive behavior in a world that was falling apart. Across from the penguin enclosure was a large roof I recognized as the zoo store. Dipping down, I saw the store had been ransacked, floor to ceiling windows smashed, counters and tables shattered, wooden display walls crushed into fine powder. T-shirts lay mud smeared and trampled. Something had made quick work of a snack display then gone on to, to decapitate and de-stuff a mound of plush animals. Hats, bags, coffee canteens, and African drums lay abandoned and wrecked. In an unambiguous statement, a mountainous pastiche of dung sat under a busted door frame. The disrespect for mofo property and the eerie silence bothered me. But the image of a tiny dejected Pomeranian, all alone with her ginger head in her paws as the black tide came in to swallow her, tugged at my heart and kept me focused. I lifted, more determined than ever to find the one who opens doors, a mofo, blood pumping through his veins, his head populated with red strands and innovative thoughts. I knew he was here. Woodland Park Zoo had changed its spots. There had been monumental upheaval here. From above, I could see how the foliage had declared war, bursting forth from the soil, electric green and surging with life. Tropical vines and stranglers were performing a creeping asphyxiation of the zoo. They were forming their own vertical superhighways as weeping willows surveyed them from above. Carnivorous pitcher plants with their baited jugs of acid had spread, ready for carnage. Bromeliads and Japanese quince and Tatarian honeysuckle, magnolias, red elderberry, English laurel, and bishop's hat were active commanders in this battle, all wild and hungry and glossy green. I thought it a diverse and unnatural tussle. In some areas of the zoo, walkways were smothered in plant life. The sides of buildings held hostage by a weedy ambush. 
What I saw was silent war. This was a hostile takeover, the foliage committing mass destruction, swallowing up concrete one millimeter at a time. The mofo who'd been freeing the animals hadn't been maintaining the flora. I could see how it could, how it would ju just be too big a job, how garden greens can fight back and swallow a city whole. And I imagined he'd been busy doing what we'd been doing, surviving. A flash of movement caught my eye, so I gingerly perched halfway up a towering Sitka spruce and traced the motion. Ambling below was a hulking mass of muscle with the prickly skin of a durian. It took its time, veined and prehistoric, dragging its leg and shadowed claws along a walkway of weeds. Locked in terrifying jaws that leaked frothy str strings of spittle was the limp body of a meerkat. The Komodo stopped, lifting its blocky head to register me. Our eyes met, and my, eyes, my knees buckled. The dragon let the meerkat's lifeless form drop like a winter stole. A dagger-like tongue in salmon pink stabbed the air, tasting me, licking information about the one who keeps. I felt my throat close, an anger I could barely contain surging through me. This creature was godlike, mesmerizing me with his armored form, genes that stretched back millions of years through time. I would never be a match for him. We both knew this. And here he moved with the slow sovereignty of the vines and the ivy. He was silent and insidious in his takeover, assuming dominance over his new domain with no respect for the lives that we were losing, no understanding that this wasn't his world to conquer. This is the world of the mofos, I yelled at the dragon. They had sculpted and designed and trimmed and cut down and bettered everything. And here was Komodo, cool and commanding, an indomitable takeover. Like nature, the predator that shows no mercy. He was lumbering, puissant proof that mofos were losing a battle against the earth. You disgust me, you scaly fuck bucket, I screamed at him. Then I took flight before I did something utterly stupid. My eyes darted, wings cutting through the air with frantic flaps that sounded like the flicking of cotton sheets. I scoured for movement, for red hair, for the soldier who'd helped me win this war. I lowered into an area called Banyan Wild a recreation of tropical Asia, rife with thick vines and bamboo. I hovered over an enclosure that said it contained sloth bears, but found its star occupants missing, the glass wall along the front of the enclosure in shards. Perching on a large rock, I studied the terrain, searching for signs of life. A burning sensation in the back of my head told me I was being watched. I hopped and spun to find three sets of shining eyes watching me with heads cocked. I felt the feathers on the back of my neck hike up crows. They sat on a thick log that balanced on the sloth bear's sunbathing rock and conferred with one another in a series of clicks and rattles. I blocked them out. I flapped to a neighboring, a neighboring enclosure, finding it to be the densely jungled home of the Malayan tigers. Again, the enclosure was empty, glass front gone. My heart started to race. To avoid the nuclear meltdown that was building steadily inside me, I lifted again looking for my mofo, flying above an enclosure that had a covered viewing area, which had information and signs about its inhabitants. The safety glass, to prevent visiting mofos from coming face to face with eight 350-pound western lowland gorillas, lay shattered all over the hay and concrete. Acid rose in my throat. I swallowed and hurriedly took flight. My mofo was here and I knew it. Discovering fragmented glass at the front of the jaguar exhibit made flying difficult as a tremor took hold of my wings. Where are you, mofo? I beat my wings, trying to stay airborne, trying to breathe as I fluttered over a building in the rainforest loop. It had a glass roof, and when I found it to be intact, my pinions stabilized, normal flight possible again. Intact glass, a crystalline beacon of hope. I ducked into the building and was transported to the tropics by thick vines and the bulbous, gnarly rooted buttresses of exotic trees. Animal exhibits sat side by side. Goliath pink toe tarantula yellow anaconda, false water cobra, poison dart frog, emerald green boa, tiger rat snake. The animals were all gone, a tiling of debris and glass glittering on the ground. I started to hyperventilate, as if the anaconda had its muscly middle squeezing tightly around my throat. I shot by the enclosures, searching for life and signs of a mofo's intent, a glass-shattering axe, a life hammer, an emergency window-breaker escape tool, when I felt eyes upon me. Squatting on a log in the rainforest building, 
surrounded by thick foliage and signs of a mass evacuation, sat a shiny body. He stared at me with a smug expression, a pseudo smirk. Where are the healthy mofos, I asked him, my breath hitched, the ones who walk on two legs. Past the Moonstone River, his skin was lime green, as polished as an airport shoe. His funny little nostrils twitched, and his face made it hard to believe he wasn't making fun of me, which was adding to my agitation. What? That's not what I ask you. Where are the mofos, I asked, reading the sign behind his shattered terrarium that identified him as a waxy monkey tree frog. Past the Moonstone River, he replied repeating himself, and I shot out of there, the fury inside me billowing like hot gas. I didn't have a second longer to spend in the company of a bewildered frog and a stupid waxy rictus. It seemed beneath me to eat a tropical frog out of spite, so I bottled my rage and took off. I scoured the tropical rainforest building, huffing in tight-chested breaths, a reedy whistle emanating from deep inside me. I searched tropical bird aviaries, banana quits, red ri- crested finches, blue-gray tanagers, spangled gotingas, they were all gone. An ocelot and a bushmaster, which according to the unflattering sign by its empty enclosure, is a venomous serpent serpent with a delightful heat detector pits on both sides of its head that hides in the soil, waiting to assassinate passing mammals, were nowhere to be seen. Even the home of my acquaintances, the golden lion tamarind enclosure, lay empty. And the glass, everywhere, sprinkled like fallen icicles, every shard breaking my heart. And then I found the toucan exhibit. There was no visible toucan. No lollipop-beaked bird who lorded over your childhood cereal bowl. The exhibit was pit-like, with an open grated roof and an intact wire mesh fencing on its periphery. Stuffed like spam were all the mofos who had fallen in through the grating, filling every inch of the enclosure. The mass pulsated like a breathing tumor. The mofos were rotting and moaning, eyeballs pressed through the mash fence, greenish skin torn in rips. They looked and smelled like Dennis's canned dinner. Animals free, mofos caged, my heart trailing along by my feet. I searched in the mass of meat for red hair, one eye open for I am Bushmaster that the one had at some point freed. It was impossible to identify every mofo in that palpating tumor, but I felt a glimmer of hope spark. I couldn't see red hair. Feathered, furred, mofos, the scaled, we all share the gift of a special sense, intuition, our otherworldly knowing. Mine told me that he wasn't in the pit, but that I would find him. Thwack! Something struck me in the back of the head. I squawked, shooting off the toucan habitat's viewing ledge. Five crows with dusty feathers and mischief alight in their eyes peered at me from branches inside the golden lion tamarind's busted enclosure. These were not college crows. These were a different murder. A spiteful, careless bunch of clowns who belonged behind the bars of an aviary. One had pelted something at me. A seed. A piece of fruit. I didn't know and didn't care what it was. I hated these inky fools, these lentil-brained ass noodles. Get away from me, I screeched, flapping alongside the mass of disfigured mofos. Had they no compassion, no understanding of what was happening to the wonderful world around them? The devastating mass of sick mofos caged beside them really meant nothing at all to them? One of them cackled and launched another rapid-fire round of seeds at me. I ducked. I'd fucking had it. I charged, screaming my anguish, flapping my ferocity. I dove into the golden lion tamarind habitat, flushing out their black bodies and chasing them through the enclosed tunnel of exhibits. They squawked excitable panic and nervous laughter. Gas on the flames of my fury. We burst from the tunnel and the crows shot skyward, scattering into the evening, cackling and chattering. It was a game to them. I'd lost my whole life, everything that made sense to me, and they thought it was funny. I hated crows. Hated everything about their horrible, shadowy chicanery and ignorance. They were a limited species, bird-brained and primitive. I fluttered my gular, hating the part of me that they recognized desperately wanting to pluck off my wings and walk on two legs and have a limitless imagination. I was sick of being a patchwork of puzzle pieces, parts of this and bits of that. I was one color, but not one thing. I wanted to be perceived, to look and sound and act like I felt inside, like a mofo. In a state, I puffed and huffed as I flew southward over the zoo, ravaged by adrenaline and fear and the pain of hope. Hair-raising omens popped up in the forms of a limp raccoon that hung over a branch like a Christmas ornament, and dazzling white bones that littered the family farm petting zoo, 
informing my decision to steer clear of the nearby temperate forest area. The African savanna seemed a wiser choice, so I settled into a thick black locust tree, squawked as I impaled a foot on one of its hidden, hideous thorns, and quickly abandoned ship for a Russian olive instead. I worked on trying to calm my nerves, using Lamaze techniques I'd learned from MTV. The pressure was strangling me. Pressure of time, of leaving Dennis, of losing flight, of finding the one who opens doors, of rescuing a desperate little Pomeranian, of hating what I was born as, of wanting to change in every single iota of my life. I lamazed methodically, listening for guidance from inside, from trees, from anywhere. Nothing came. My pulse started to stabilize. From my high branch, I had an un unobstructed vantage point of a series of Kikiyua huts, a quaint rendering of an East African village. I wondered whether the real East African mofos still had their thatched homes, painting their faces in bold white and red pastes, fashioning their jewelry from bead and cowrie shell, whether lions were still a threat to them. My bones were tired from my panic tour of the world through a zoo. I realized I wasn't alone. A grating honking trumpeted into the air. The horrible sound tightened into, st into staccato shrieks, immediately recognizable as a call of distress. In the middle of an African village, a flamingo dragged herself along the ground, singing its anguish in sharp and flat notes. Her sugar pink wing hung at an odd angle, dangling near fuchsia chopstick legs that had thrashed, kicked up sand. I had a bad feeling about this. Thinking of the brawny king of reptiles and his casually chilling swagger, and the bushmaster, the largest of all pit vipers, lurking somewhere in the burgeoning shadows. The flamingo's cries echoed among the Kikiua huts, the smell of fear tight and sharp in the darkening air. I grappled with whether to drop down to help the flamingo. If she wasn't a domestic but was still cared for by mofos, did I get involved? A silvery shadow encroached, making the decision for me. The leopard was the color of a winter sky, sprinkled with a snowing of perfect black circles. She was at once soft and formidable, rounded with gentle curves and pillowy paw paws, sheaths for her retractable weapons. A study in contrast. A voluptuous tail trolled behind her. Her movements were methodical, each paw placement deliberate. The pellucid green eyes that lit her round face trained on the injured pink burn. Run! I screeched at the flamingo. Get out of here! I didn't want to watch, but I couldn't help myself. Ten paw prints in the sand were all the flamingo had left, and then its neck was in the jaws of the snow leopard. A sharp shake, a snap. She fell silent. The leopard suddenly dropped the flamingo's limp salmon neck, her rapt attention on one of the Kikiyua huts. Her body changed. The ripple that shuddered under the plush winter coat almost invisible. She had known he was coming before she saw him, before either of us saw the brooding body that strode from the hut. We hadn't seen him waiting, watching, his camouflage blending into shadows. He is seen only when he wants to be. Now the flamingo had been dispatched, and he was here to claim it. A guttural growl rumbled the roots of the Russian olive tree. From ground and branch, the snow leopard and I shared terror of brilliant orange and black stripes that stood in the center of the African village. The tiger let the growl rev and crescendo into a roar, exposing long yellowed fangs, eyes and nose wrinkling. The snow leopard tensed, placed two plush paws in front of her pink prize. Here was another war. The tiger rushed her, stopping short of her face, thrashing enormous claws. Snow leopard swiped back, her silvery paw colliding with the side of its head. Roars erupted from the throat of the tiger. The cats, one of the jungle, one of snow, lifted onto their hind legs in a horrific embrace, clawing and thrashing for dominance. A lightning round of powerful, reflexive attack. Jab, claw, swipe, lunge, charge. Agile jerks and pivots. Fur was airborne, so fast, fast as flames. The leopard let four paws hit the sand first. The tiger paced, puffed. The inch forward, met by a flurry of swipes and strained, high-pitched yowls from the leopard. Teeth and claw and fury flew. My feet strangled the branch. Tiger's face twisted with a snarl. He bit at her head with three-inch scythes. Leopard snatched the scruff of Tiger's throat. She slammed him onto his side and then it stopped. 
The leopard shot back, eyes on the tiger as she retreated, exposing the flamingo. The tiger shook his massive head and po postured over the bird that lay like a broken lawn or ornament. Snow leopard backed up slowly, farther, relinquishing her coveted kill. I didn't understand. Hadn't she been winning? And then her reason became clear. A sinister veil of orange and black sculpted from the huts. The stripes of two more tigers. Shoulder blades undulating in a liquid rise and fall. Entering, entered the African village. There were three brothers who met one another. Two tigers sniffed the victor, and with a minor squabble over the blushing bird, they tore apart her corpse. I was losing my mind. This is what Seattle had come, become, a battleground, a gladiator's pit of savages. And then, a delicious acorn of a thought drops. If I was a lone, healthy, red-headed mofo, surrounded by a brotherhood of tigers, and a bushmaster, and a snow leopard, and an acid-mouthed Komodo dragon, I wouldn't make myself easy to find either. I'd be hiding somewhere sneaky and difficult to locate. Just like how, after the big thing went down with Tiffany S., Big Jim battened down the hatches, taking up residency in the basement with World of Warcraft, Jägermeister, and Papa John's on speed dial. He'd gone to ground. I'd been searching out in the open, but that's not where a mofo in his predicament would be. Alone, he would find himself prey in these surroundings. Suddenly, I was de deafened by a hideous chorus of raucous screaming. It was that murder again. The trees around me were alive with their open beaks, their insistent screams. They were taunting me. Get away! Get away! They squawked, and I hated them so very, very much. Even more than the smell of Abercrombie and Fitch, those crumble cheese turd burgers. Crows shot out of the trees. A storm of them charged forth, beaks careening toward me. Hey! I squawked as one of the crows body-checked me square in the chest. Instantly winded. I tumbled from the tree, plummeted toward the earth. I quickly righted myself at the last inch, turning just in time to see an orange paw swiping down at me. I shot sideways, evading the tiger's hair-trigger killer instinct, escaping into the air. The brother jumped, hurling his striped bulk at me from below, excited by the thrill of a chase. I flapped hard, consumed by hatred for the pistachio-brained birds who'd almost gotten me killed. What's the matter with you assholes? I squawked rhetorically, but none of them were looking at me. They continued to scream, get away, get away, but I realized it was directed at a monster who was itching its way along the Russian olive, its trowel head tasting me where I had sat seconds before. The crows had pushed me away from the strike of a 20-foot snake whose glossy body shone with the diamond powder of a Persian carpet, even in the growing darkness. I was stunned. In shock from the savagery and the unexpected source of help, I bolted. I had to get away from this craziness. I couldn't process anything that was happening, and I couldn't leave Dennis a second longer. If I stayed here, it was only a matter of time before I became as delusional as that waxy monkey tree frog. I was having a lot of trouble with my breathing, which I chalked up to nearly getting quesadilla between tiger paws and becoming a hot pocket for a snake the size of a sewer pipe. But I didn't have time to rest. My search from the sky continued as I passed over the rest of the zoo's African savanna. Once crisp and dry, now gaining green and looking like it had been ravaged by a storm. I flew north to an area thick with firs, cedars, hemlocks, and plants native to my Washington home. None of this helped diminish the sharp pain in my chest, which ceased only when I spotted a cluster of moving bodies below. I made out the top of a ball cap, dark hair, a bald spot, long brown hair, and in the middle of the group of mofos, a redhead. I crowed my triumph to the clouds. He's here! He's here! I dipped down, carefully checking the branches of a black spruce before perching. The bird's eye view and lack of light wouldn't let me see the mofo's face. Just his bright ginger hair as he and the small group of straight-backed mofos he was with made their way along a path on the northern trail toward a cave. They were seeking shelter. I shook my head incredulous. There was hope. There was life. A living mofo. A chance at saving the world. I ducked down to follow them into the cave. It turned out to be a ground-level viewing station for zoo visitors to watch the brown bears and the otters. Unbelievably, the glass to both enclosures was still intact. They'd come here to seek refuge, to use their heads. They were here to devise a plan for survival and to contain the escaped animals. The mofos gathered together in front of the glass of the brown bear exhibit, ripples from the waiting water catching the last traces of light and making them dance around the cave. From the ground, I watched my red-headed mofo as he approached the glass, pressing an intact hand against its surface. 
He drew his head backward, as if in mesmeric reverence, expressing gratitude to a power high above. There was a moment of silence. Then he bashed his head against the glass with a hollow crack. No. He shot his head back and launched it at the glass again with a thwack. No. The romp of otters in the neighboring enclosure swarmed in a cloud of panic. The mofos around the Red Hood joined him in bashing their skulls with superlative power. No. In front of them, separated by a small wading pool and some glass, two famished brown bears paced on the water's edge. No. The smacking became more frantic. Clack, clack, clack. No. The first crack in the glass was born, shooting like a tiny lightning streak and allowing for the breath of chaos. Clack, clack, clack. The mofos kept using their heads. No. The crack grew. Branches which ripped through the grass. The glass. No. The bear's impatient dance intensified, one of them excitingly lifting on his hind legs. He was standing, a mirror of the mofos. They waited, stomachs and throats releasing low growls of anticipation for what was coming to them. From the air I heard the horrific sounds of gushing water and a bear breaking fast, a sound I will forever hear on clammy nights when sleep is elusive. I'd been given false information, a scheme. I had blindly trusted the information from Aura, and it had been wrong. A lie, no better than an email scam. It was exactly like the real internet, filled with festering weirdos and keyboard clowns. I should have known, should have remembered how Big Jim felt when he'd fallen hard for Oksana, a duck-billed Russian beauty with whom he'd been messaging for months. After swapping intimate details, addresses, deep secrets, and a series of Anthony Weiner-inspired photos, Big Jim sent Oksana $4,000 to cover her airline ticket to Seattle, a rent, and liquid courage in a bottle of Scully, in a bottle of vodka, so she could leave her abusive husband. Oksana turned out to be a cyber fabrication. Big Jim had been spilling the contents of his heart and scrotum to an online troll. Now I'd fallen for it too. Fallen for the lies of three asshats who'd concocted a story about a redhead. They had sold me the same thing that Oksana had sold to Big Jim. False hope. Because what I realized watching the redheaded mofo in the bear and otter viewing area was that all of the glass in the city had been smashed by the sick mofos. I remembered the cell phone bait dangling from the lamppost where mofos teamed below, hurtling themselves to reach it. I thought about the message at the oyster house. Tell Peter John Stein I love him. Tell him, but do not use your phone. And I thought about Big Jim when I pulled out his cell phone, how he'd gone from swiping the basement walls mindlessly with his finger to being a savage hunter, a desperate monster. There had been no vigilante redhead setting the zoo animals free out of the goodness of his heart. The sick mofos no longer had hearts. I'd known they were looking for phones, but I hadn't put it all together in my blindness. They were attracted to all the glass because they'd mistaken it for what they were really looking for. Screams. I flew above the zoo's twisted green mass, the stabbing pain in my chest back again. It was hard to stay airborne, maybe because of the weight in my heart, because you can't fly when it's heavy, and the adage is true. Maybe, I thought, something is deeply wrong, and suddenly I found I could no longer flap my wings, and I plummeted, crashing into rolling tumbles, head, wing, side, foot, repeat, hitting the ground. I came to a stop, wings akimbo, the landing of a challenged fledging, fledgling. I righted myself, shaken off the dirt, and stared at the sign in front of me. It depicted a scene. In its center was a picture of a green stroller. Next to the stroller was a picture of a sandwich bag full of goldfish crackers. A sinister silhouette had taken the sandwich bag hostage, holding it above the st stroller, taunting, malicious. Stow your snacks, said the sign. The silhouette was a crow. I couldn't take it anymore. I launched into the air using every ounce of what I had left, heart on fire, and flapped as fast as I could, away from the crows and the savagery and the lies, streaming above a world that had too many thorns for me. I had to get back to Dennis, to the last remnant of sanity I had. Darkness had spread its onyx blanket, and that might have been why I committed the most classic and fatal of avian bloopers, particularly ironic given the lack of intact glass to be found. I smashed full speed into a glass window. Stunned on impact, my legs stiffened as I plunged to the earth, vision turning black. Wow. There you go. Chapter 16. See you next time.